It's Christmas 1963, and this is the cruise ship Laconia. She is one of the smartest and most luxurious cruise ships afloat, painted a brilliant white. Aboard her are 646 carefree passengers who've so far enjoyed three days at sea, whittling away the hours playing deck games in the sun and enjoying cocktail parties and dances at night. They're all excited for Christmas and the New Year, and a sunny cruise to the Canary Islands is the perfect way to ring in 1964. But few aboard could even conceive of the abject horror in store for them in just a few short hours, because this will be the last sunset Laconia will ever see in its service career. It's early in the morning, and the Southampton docks are quiet, but soon there'll be a buzz with activity. Moored on one side of the wharf is the stately ocean liner Queen Elizabeth, but tied up alongside is the cruise ship Laconia. Soon passengers will be filing up the gangway aboard the ship for a long-awaited and much-anticipated holiday. Laconia wasn't built as a cruise ship though. Her life had begun all the way back in 1929 with the construction and launch of a pair of truly grand ocean liners with a couple of unforgettable names. They were the Johan van Alden Barnevelt and its sister ship, the Marnix van Sint Aldegonde. Johan van Alden Barnevelt, or the JVO, was built for the Dutch Netherland Line, and her sister ship, the Marnix van Sint Aldegonde, was launched at the end of that same year. The pair are of decent size, about 609 feet or 186 meters long, and 19,000 gross registered tons. Netherland Line was a passenger transport company that ran services between the Dutch East Indies, or modern day Indonesia, and Europe, and the ships were the largest Dutch passenger ships built up to that point. The pair had a successful career through the 1930s, but then the war broke out and the JVO and the Marnix both became troop transports, hurriedly converted for the task in just a week in 1941. JVO could now carry over 4,000 troops and the ship pulled off the roll perfectly, sailing to the European and Pacific theatres without incident. But her sister, the Marnix, wasn't so lucky, and she was sunk by German aircraft in 1943. After the war, the JVO carried troops again during the Indonesian War of Independence, but finally by the 1950s she was returned to passenger service. Throughout the rest of the decade, the ship served mainly as a migrant carrier, bringing European immigrants to new lives in Australia. It was a far cry from her glamorous pre-war life, but then in the early 1960s there was a rude interruption to even this humble service. The jet airliner could carry passengers across oceans in a mere matter of hours, where ocean liners took days or even weeks. Almost overnight, the passenger trade largely dried up, and while some lines continued trying to eke out a profit, enticing passengers who weren't too keen on flying, the Netherland line was not one of them, and the old JVO was put up for sale. But this is where fate intervened, because instead of being sold for scrap metal, it was purchased and destined for a new and exciting career. See, by the 1960s, cruising had become more attainable for the everyday family, and middle class and workers from Europe could afford budget cruises to sunny locations that would previously have been unthinkable. Cruise lines began popping up all over the place, and instead of building new ships specifically for the purpose, they capitalised on the glut of retired ocean liners going up for sale in the wake of the jet plane's newfound dominance. The JVO was an attractive option for prospective buyers. When it was launched, the ship represented a new pinnacle of luxury for passenger ships on the Far East service. The interiors were carefully designed by artists Carel Adolphe Lyon Cachet and sculptor Lambertus Gael, and since the ship was intended as a link between the Netherlands and its distant colony, the materials on board were chosen to emphasise the connection between the two regions. Tropical timber and marble were heavily utilised, while the sculptures of Zale decorated many of the rooms. On board was an indoor-outdoor pool, one of the first of its kind, protected by a retractable glass roof. The ship's seven passenger decks were crammed with lounges, bars, nurseries for children, libraries, smoking rooms, all clad in ornate timber panelling, heavily detailed and simply gorgeous in a unique Dutch style. Amidships was the cavernous, two-deck high statesman lounge featuring a beaten copper ceiling, ornately panelled walls and four ornate chandeliers. Of similar grand scale was the stunning social hall and music salon. 
This grand space was intended for onboard musical performances given for the benefit of the first class passengers. The JVO didn't last long on the market. Despite being 33 years old, the ship was bought by newcomer cruise operator Greek Line in 1963 to complement its other cruise ship, the Arcadia. That ship had been a Spartan former immigrant liner when they first bought it, but the Johan van Olden Barnevelt was different. The ship was like a floating palace, and an art gallery all in one. Its elaborate interiors, richly carved wood, miles of deck space, light and fresh air and passenger comforts and amenities would be a major selling point for the company. In March 1963, the ship was sold for an undisclosed amount and handed over to its new owners. The old JVO docked in Genoa, Italy for overhaul as Greek lines set to work completing the conversion that would see her emerge as a luxury cruise ship. Her funnels received the cheerful Greek line livery, blue and yellow. Picked out in gold on the ship's bow was her new name. She was Greek Line's pride and joy, and they named her Laconia. On December 19th, 1963, Laconia steamed out of Southampton with 646 passengers and 376 crew on board. For months since her introduction in April, she'd become a popular cruise ship, visiting Mediterranean ports like Lisbon, Vigo, Tangiers and Cadiz, but despite being Greek owned, the ship was operated out of England and a firm favourite among British travellers. This cruise, her 18th for Greek line, would be special, an 11 day escape from the dreary British winter over Christmas, heading first for Madeira, then Tenerife for an overnight stay on Christmas Eve, and finally Las Palmas. It was marketed by Greek line as a once in a life opportunity to escape, and one of their pamphlets even read, here is a holiday you will remember and talk about for the rest of your life. In command was 53-year-old Matthias Zabas, a lifelong sailor and Greek line skipper for 15 years, formerly of the Arcadia. From the bridge, he must have looked down with pride at his grand ship, no shrinking violet at 20,000 tons. On December 13th, less than a week before sailing, Laconia had been rigorously inspected by British authorities and her crew had been put through a full fire and lifeboat drill. They and their ship passed with flying colours, and she was given the Ministry of Transport's Certificate of Seaworthiness. Laconia was considered absolutely up to date in its safety, with the usual arrangement of watertight compartments and the double bottom to prevent sinking from collisions to be sure, as well as an array of 24 lifeboats providing places for 1,500 people, far more than her total capacity of passengers and crew. Conditions ahead were clear and bright, and Captain Zabis had travelled these waters many times before. Disaster and danger must have been the furthest thing away from anybody's minds, especially the crew. They'd already had a full cruise season to get comfortable with their new ship, and now they knew her well. The few hundred crew was a multinational mix of Greeks, Cypriots, Dutch, Germans, British, Belgians, French and Chinese. On that first day at sea, Captain Zabis gave a lifeboat drill for passengers. 27-year-old passenger Chris Smallbone gave the first hint at danger when he gave a subsequent interview and recalled that he was the only passenger who actually bothered showing up at his muster station. The crew also made no effort at guiding the passengers either, apparently content with having just turned on the siren and showing up at the lifeboats. Smallbone took off his life jacket, maybe feeling a little sheepish, and went back to enjoy his holiday. Laconia's cruise director was a Mr. George Herbert, a Greek line veteran from the Arcadia who was extremely popular and had cultivated a bit of a following from regular passengers. His duty was to ensure the fair payers were entertained and happy, and as always, he had his work cut out for him. But it could have been worse, because Laconia had actually been underbooked, probably because of the holiday season. This was the ship's first ever Christmas cruise after all. He oversaw the satisfaction of all 646 passengers, mostly comprised of elderly Brits who were escaping the cold. Aboard there were three honeymooning couples, schoolboys joining their parents in Madeira, and a party of five London taxicab drivers on a well-earned break. Those first few days spent aboard were idyllic, as passengers began to familiarise themselves with the vast ship and its dazzling array of public rooms. Down on the upper deck, the old JVO's hair salon had been completely overhauled and modernised, a task headed up by hairdresser and salon owner Tony Kay. Kay had approached Greek Line for the concessionary rights for their new ship, and they'd agreed. He had set up shop and paid them for their real estate. Kay was also trying something new, bringing the glamour of city hair salons aboard ships. Laconia would be his first foray into the idea, and the salon proved popular to women passengers who wanted to look their best for the many cocktail parties and dances held on board. Another extremely popular gathering place was the brand new Agora shopping centre and lounge at the very stern of the ship. 
In JVO, this had been a promenade, but Greek line encased it in glass and filled it with light wicker furniture so passengers could relax, shop, and watch the ocean pass by astern. Cruise director Herbert organised games, parties, and balls for the passengers to keep them occupied if watching the ocean and relaxing just wasn't enough. The mood aboard the ship was appropriately festive, and on December 22nd there was scheduled a costume party for passengers, the Tropical Tramps Ball. It was a happy and relaxing time at sea, and all seemed well aboard Laconia. Except, all was not well. Beneath that nice fresh coat of thick white paint was a ship in excess of 30 years old. Throughout those first few days at sea, circuits had shorted and the crew had issues with the ship's electrical systems. These irritating issues had actually plagued the ship since Greek Line had bought her, but no matter. The ship had an automatic fire alarm system with two fire stations, specialist firefighting equipment, and an illuminator panel in the bridge which could identify where a fire had originated. Laconia and its happy complements sailed off into the night. They didn't know it yet, but for many aboard, it would be their last. At 11pm on December 22nd, three days before Christmas, Laconia was motoring about 250 miles or 400 kilometres west of Gibraltar. The Tropical Tramps ball was in full swing up in the Statesman's Lounge, and Captain Zarbus was judging passenger costumes. Herbert, the cruise director, announced the King and Queen Hobo to uproarious laughter and applause, and Zarbus entertained a party of passengers at his table. But then, there came the smell of smoke. Faint, but noticeable. Passengers initially dismissed it as cigar smoke and carried on with the fun. Up on the bridge, all was quiet and normal. The sea was calm and the night clear. But then, the fire alarm indicator panel lit up and an alarm bell started ringing. Smoke had been detected on the ship's main deck near the hairdressing salon. At about the same time, two stewards were walking along the ship's corridors when they noticed smoke pouring out from underneath the locked door of the salon. Wondering what was happening within, they opened it, and then all hell was unleashed. The salon had been completely consumed by fire, and with a roar, the flames leapt out into the hallway and began consuming the timber-clad walls and carpeted floors. The two men grabbed fire extinguishers and attempted to prevent it from spreading any further, but it was already too late. Smoke filled the hallway, and the fire was already well beyond the point of containment. One of the stewards rushed to inform the ship's purser, Antonio Boghetti, while the other stayed behind fighting the blaze. The salon had been closed for the night, so the fire had started and raged without anybody noticing for a full half hour. Directly above the flashpoint, just one deck up, was the Statesman's Lounge, full of joyful attendees of the Tropical Tramps Ball. Laconia's purser Baghetti was just preparing to leave his office for a break when one of the stewards burst in and breathlessly reported the fire. Baghetti sprung into action and rushed to gather together a six-man crew to fight the blaze. They charged towards the flames, but they too were unable to contain it. The simple fact is that the fire had been burning for too long, and the only thing these men could do was to try to slow its spread for as long as possible, but already it was fanning out through hallways and corridors on the ship's main deck. Outside, Laconia looked elegant and peaceful, but already the fire was out of control. Suddenly throughout the ship, the general fire alarm sounded, activated automatically by the fire emergency system. But instead of blaring throughout the ship, it softly rang, one passenger recalling that it sounded more like the bell you'd use to call a steward for tea. For the hundreds of people directly above the fire at the Tropical Tramps Ball, the alarm went totally unnoticed, drowned out by the music and the laughter. Come for my life. There was no charge at all, I just... In the ship's theatre, just after the Statesman's Lounge, Chris Smallbone was watching a late night screening of Call Me Buona with Bob Hope and Anita Eckberg when the fire alarm started ringing. Yeah, I'd better go check my dictionary. The audience thought it was just part of the movie at first, but when the bells didn't stop, they began to nervously chat and look around at one another. Then, there came the dreaded, ominous smell of smoke. They didn't know it yet, but directly beneath their feet, the fire was raging, surging along the main passenger corridor on the upper deck. Confused, they began to slowly file out to see what was happening. Throughout the ship, in lounges and corridors, promenades and cabins, passengers began to smell smoke. There was no panic, just curiosity, as they milled around asking crew as to what was happening. The only problem is, they didn't know either. Incredibly, neither did the ship's captain, 
forward in the Statesman's Lounge, Zarbus was finally informed by a member of the crew that there was a serious situation at hand. He excused himself from the ball and left the passengers and cruise director Herbert's hands for the time being. He strained to listen for the fire alarm and could only just hear it. Panicked, he rushed to the bridge and attempted to send out a message via the ship's PA system, but nothing was working. The fire had disabled it entirely. By now it was 11.30pm and at the Tropical Tramp's ball, the band was still playing. The same beautiful, elaborately carved tropical wood that had once been a selling point of the vessel was now providing fuel to a fire that was eating the ship from within. The countdown to safely evacuate the burning ship's passengers was on, and it had already started half an hour ago. Zarbus ordered the radio officer to send out a distress signal. The radio operator of the Argentine vessel Salta was in the middle of another routine shift when an urgent message crackled through his headset. It was just five short words, but they were enough to send a shiver down any crewman's spine. It said, fire aboard, immediate assistance please. He got the ship's position and raced to inform his captain. Meanwhile on Laconia, the fire could no longer go unnoticed. Smoke was now pouring into the ballroom and couldn't be mistaken for anything but a serious blaze. At this point, the only official left in the ballroom was the cruise director, Mr. Herbert, who only knew as much as the other passengers as to the state of the ship. But figuring that the ship was on fire and realizing that the passengers had been largely left to their own devices, Herbert took it upon himself to evacuate the statesman lounge and guide the people inside towards the lifeboats. Throughout the ship, crew and passengers now began to sense the danger as acrid smoke began to seep through ventilation ducts and corridors. The fire was burning deep in Laconia's centre, the ship's very heart, and any passengers sound asleep in their bunks would have been cut off from escape within minutes. The varnished timber, the ornate panels, the carpeting, synthetic upholstery and decorations, all of it was incinerated and burned white hot inside the ship's steel hull. Time was running out, and cruise director Herbert must have known it. He mustered all the passengers he could at the boats and began to see their lowering away. But here, there were fresh problems, because the nice new coat of paint applied to Laconia by Greek Line had actually concealed bad rot and corrosion of the ship's life-saving apparatus, much of it the original machinery which had been installed way back in 1929. At the demonstrative lifeboat drill given for the Ministry of Transport a week prior, only five boats had been launched. But now, in an actual emergency situation, many of the lifeboats were stuck up on their davits and able to move, thanks to rusty components and jammed actions. The boats that could move began to be filled by dazed and confused passengers, many of whom had simply just stepped out of their cabins moments prior to ask what was happening. Now, in the dead of night, and still in their pyjamas, they were hurriedly ushered into the lifeboats and swung out over the side of the ship. Englishman Arthur Edson and his business partner Les Cull had boarded Laconia with their families to celebrate 25 years of successful co-ownership of a metals firm. But their celebration had turned to horror, and the two now had to see their loved ones off in lifeboats. Chaos reigned supreme, but somehow the two men got their wives and children into the boats. Arthur later said that, We got everyone safely into the lifeboat, except Les and myself. I jumped and managed to land on the boat, but Les didn't jump. The sailors yelled and pushed the lifeboat away from the Laconia, and they left my friend clinging to the outside of the ship. He pulled himself back up, and next to him, boat 22 was having trouble being let down. I yelled at him, not 22 Les, not 22, but I have not seen him since. Just then, lifeboat 22 tipped over and threw a whole bunch of small children into the sea. They screamed, help me, help me, and there was a young padre who was trying to grab as many as possible and get them in the boat, but as we rowed away, you could still hear those children screaming for help. It was awful. Down on the passenger decks, a few brave crew went door to door, calling out for any feeble or elderly passengers needing assistance and breaking down doors. Some passengers saw this and thought that they were looting, but many were just breaking into staterooms to find life jackets, since the lockers on deck were rusted shut. At the lifeboats, Herbert did a fine job of overseeing the launching, but the crew members who were lowering the boats had to work hard to overcome the rusted and failing machinery. Some boats smashed hard into the side of the ship's hull, causing injuries, but others simply broke free of the chains and spilled all their occupants into the ocean, drowning them or setting them adrift into the blackness. Some of the boats with davits that did function had their blocks gunked up and jammed by the beautiful fresh white paint. 
By 12 a.m., the Laconia had developed a list to starboard, further hampering the lifeboat lowering, and for dozens still inside the ship, their exit routes had been cut off by the fire. They screamed out for help from their open portholes. A few brave Laconia crewmen tied ropes around their waists and were lowered down over the side of the ship to try to pluck the passengers from their cabins. A second distress call was sent by the radio operator, and by now a half dozen ships were aware of the situation and en route, but hours away. So for the meantime, Laconia and her complement were on their own. At 12.22am, Laconia's radio operator sent another distress call. We are leaving the ship. Please, immediate assistance. Please help. But then there was silence. The radio operator had to abandon his post as smoke and flames began to surge toward his station. The lifeboats, all that could be launched, were finally away by half past, but only 12 of the 24 total boats could be launched at all. By now, the fire had spread throughout the ship's middle, so flames began to lick at the base of Laconia's funnels and light the night sky with a dull red glow. Aboard Laconia, a few hundred passengers and crew remained trapped as the ship burned under their feet. Many of those left behind on Laconia were elderly people unable to climb overboard. They rushed aft to the perceived safety of the Agora shopping centre and gathered there away from the choking smoke. Cruise director Herbert stayed with them and attempted to keep some order. But there still wasn't a huge deal of panic because nobody actually knew what was going on. It was obviously a fire, but word had somehow got out that it was coming under control as the firefighting parties below deck continued to spray seawater on it. The refuge at the Agora was only temporary. By 1am the fire had finally reached it, and the time had come to get out or burn alive. Ladders and knotted ropes were hurriedly strung out through the Agora's glass windows, and the space, which had once been a delightful spot to sit and sip tea and coffee, was now turned into a scene of panic and horror as dozens of people climbed unsteadily out through the open windows and over the ship's side. They were four stories up in the air and below them was blackness. For many, it was just too much. Some lost their footing or their nerves and tumbled from the ladders, crashing into the side of the ship or breaking their necks in the fall. Lieutenant Colonel John Wilkinson and his wife, both in their 60s, debated who should jump first. Mrs. Wilkinson didn't want to jump at all, but her husband reassured her and said, but darling, we've got to jump. So he led the way and jumped first. She followed quickly after him, but when she swam up to the surface, he was gone. She could hear him calling, but she lost him in the darkness. He was never seen again. Mrs. Susan Redfern stood with her husband and pulled out a small wrapped Christmas present. She had retrieved it from her luggage earlier when they were taking their lifeboat jackets from her stateroom. Here you are, love. Merry Christmas, she said, and he opened it to find a pair of beautiful gold cufflinks. The pair scrambled down a ladder, followed closely by their 13-year-old daughter, who had been a winner at the Tropical Tramps Ball only shortly before. Then the trio plunged into the ocean. Father and daughter clung together, but Mrs. Redfern was lost in the waves. Many people went into the water from the Agora shopping centre at the stern, but the ship's rising and pitching in the waves sucked them in under its counter and brought the full weight of the ship down on their heads, killing them. 27-year-old Chris Smallbones scurried down one of the ladders in his life jacket and took to the ocean, swimming together with hundreds of others who tried to band together in the waves. They watched as their ship glowed in the night sky, and only now could they see the true scale of the disaster. From stem to stern, the Laconia burned, smoke pouring in thick columns into the sky. There were explosions throughout the ship and crashing as the superstructure simply collapsed as the steel failed through the sheer heat of the blaze. Laconia was a smoking, drifting inferno. Nobody knew how many had died in the fire or how many there were set adrift in the ocean. The survivors in the lifeboats looked on in horror as their cruise ship burned. It must have seemed like an eternity that they drifted and their ship glowed brightly in the night. But then finally, in the distance, a light was spotted on the horizon. It was a ship, and rescue had finally come. Laconia's distress calls had certainly not gone unheeded. The Argentine passenger ship Salta had made full speed for the Laconia's last reported position and arrived on station at last at 3.30am, four hours after the first distress call. Salter quickly put its own lifeboats into the ocean, and as night turned to twilight, the scale of the rescue operation became apparent. Groups of survivors were spread out miles across the ocean, floating in their life jackets. Laconia's lifeboats made their way for Salter while the ship's crew began to coordinate plucking individuals from the ocean. And a half hour later, while this was underway, a second ship, 
the British tanker Montcalm arrived, followed closely behind by the Belgian liner Charleville. Salter collected nearly 500 people from the ocean, and the other ship's crews got to work too. Within hours, there were a half dozen ships on station, their lifeboats and launches darting back and forth searching for people in the ocean. The curious passengers of the rescue ships looked out of their portholes and windows at the blackened hulk of Laconia, which was still burning all those hours later. It wasn't just ships that picked up the distress call, so too did a United States Air Force base in Madrid. Somewhere off the coast of Madeira, 33-year-old pilot Captain Don Spencer was at the controls of his C-54 Skymaster, scanning the ocean for any signs of the stricken liner. He burst through cloud cover, and there was a sight the likes of which he'd never seen in his previous 4,000 hours of flying. He later said, I spotted the glow of the burning ship as we came through the overcast. There were bodies floating in the water, dead from exposure. There were others in the life jackets, waving and paddling. The thing that touched me the most was seeing an old lady lying on her back alone in the ocean. She was wearing a life jacket, and as we flew over her, she feebly waved both arms at us. We dropped a 20-man life raft right next to her, but she was too weak to get in it. Spencer and his crew stayed on station to help coordinate the rescue, dropping rafts to anybody that waved from the sea, and they flew like this for some 12 hours. By daybreak, the drama wasn't yet completely over. The rescue ship stood too, none keen on getting too close because one of Laconia's surviving engineers informed them that the ship's 500 tons of fuel oil could explode at any moment. They watched helpless as the ship blazed away and the thick poles of smoke reached high up into the air. Eventually, the crew of the Belgian ship Charleville got a party together and at incredible risk of their own safety, set out towards Laconia to board her and search for any remaining survivors. Some had been spotted by the circling aircraft, still clinging desperately onto the outside of the ship with any handhold they could get, be it a railing or a ladder. The crew of Charleville stepped aboard and shied away from the intense heat of the blaze, scrambling up the side of the ship on ladders to search what decks hadn't been totally consumed by the fire. They made an incredible discovery. Captain Zarbus had survived the night on board his burning ship, and they found him pacing the deck. He was taken off and became the last man to leave Laconia alive. Chris Smallbone had spent almost three hours in the freezing water before he was pulled out of the waves by a lifeboat, and he survived, but many others were not so lucky. The water was cold, and four hours in the ocean was too much for many. It's estimated that more than half of the people who died that night died of exposure or the cold, rather than the flames. Throughout the morning and into the early afternoon, the C-54s searched the waves and dropped flares and life rafts, and one of the rescue ships would send a lifeboat to retrieve them. In the end, about 75 passengers were rescued thanks to these efforts. For the air crews though, it was a tough sight. One of Captain Don Spencer's crewmen recalled, I saw a little baby lying alone in a lifesaver made for a man. She was dead, and I felt sick. The next minute, somebody started waving to us from the water, and we cheered up. The living and the dead were very close together. Another remembered, You could feel the heat from the burning vessel coming through the open door of the aircraft, and I saw that the paint had peeled off of her. Later in the afternoon, about 3pm, Montcalm broadcast a message. To all ships, number of survivors is now 722. Please, all ships' vicinity, give immediate assistance. Need all possible assistance. Many bodies in the water. 19-year-old Ken Fritz was on Spencer's plane too, and he said, I couldn't get it out of my mind that this was once a happy ship. I pictured all those people wearing fancy dress and whooping it up in a liner bound for the sun. Now there she was, a burning hulk and people dying in the water around her. In all, some 128 people died that night when their ship caught fire. 894 lucky survivors were pulled out of the water by a brilliant rescue operation coordinated by the rescue ships and RAF and US Air Force personnel. While the survivors were taken by the rescue ships to Madeira, an attempt was made to take Laconia under tow and salvage the hull. Dutch and Norwegian tugs arrived on scene, but the sea came up choppy and the tugs laboured furiously. And just days later, on December 29th, the tow lines were parted as Laconia began to list over onto her side. 
the charred hulk of the once happy ship capsized in the waves and sank within three minutes. looking around on the top deck for a gas mask well, to get down to the smoke so if I can get my baby who was, wasn't with us. As I got myself a gas mask and was trying to get down to him with it on and it was, I think it was a Greek engineer, he was in a blue overall and he brought, um, he brought him up to me and as soon as the baby saw me he stopped crying then he was crying but he was, uh, how he managed to get through the smoke my baby I don't know because I couldn't bear it without a mask on you see. Well, you know, nobody took it seriously at first. We thought, well, somebody must have got drunk and fallen against the bell or, you know, we just couldn't believe it. It couldn't happen, you know. And nobody knew the lifeboat drill, you see. We never knew instructions. Apparently, uh, the lifeboats are meant to stay within 100 yards of the boat for survivors. And nobody gave any instructions to this, you know. We didn't know any of this. And we had no rudder on our boat or anything. We didn't... We were on the side where the, the boat was uh, swaying towards and... We couldn't seem to get away from the boat, you know, it seemed to be coming towards us. And eventually we managed to get round the other side and drift away, you know, rowing. 